Hey everyone, another layout update today. Uh, a little bit different, I'm going to be talking about the signal bridge that I'm working on. In my last layout update, I talked about this bridge briefly. This is a kit that I've had for a long time, and what's nice about working on uh, this hobby of you know model railroads is that you can kind of switch between things as you get burnt out. Uh, I've been working on a lot of scenery lately, and I kind of got burnt out from it, so I switched it up. This bridge provided some motivation to get going, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'll talk about the bridge first, the actual just physical construction and, and what I'm doing with this. Then I'll talk a little bit more about the electronics and everything else as well uh, here later in the video. So here in Michigan, CSX is the primary line that I'm modeling. And they inherited, you know, all sorts of lines, primarily from Conrail and other railroads, you know, in the past. So it's kind of a mix of signals everywhere in terms of the different signal types. You can see those types when you look at, like, the actual... Um, aspect charts for all the different possible aspects you have. I mean, it's even different. They've got different rules for, you know, former Conrail lines and SCL and CNO and stuff like that. And they're a little bit different. And then I've got a Conrail aspect list here too for all the different uh, signal combinations. Just to understand, you know, myself, all the different color light combinations I need for um, the different aspects. Anyway, in my area, the primary signal type you see is the searchlight signal type. Typically either two or three light searchlights, uh, pretty much everywhere. I don't really see much of anything else. So that's what I wanted to model with this bridge. Now, this bridge itself is kind of an older style bridge, you know, probably going back to the steam era. You don't see too many like this anymore, although there are still some in Michigan that I have seen. I have some photo evidence of, so I know they still exist, and that over the time the railroads have upgraded to more modern signal types. So I use this bridge as a base, and then I basically just kind of put it together for you know what you would see typically today on the railroads. So this bridge, this bridge is going to be sitting on my, on my layout um, on the two main lines, and then there's a siding here that will come in. And this will be sitting right before those switches, uh, protecting the switches going out. And following that design, I wanted to use, like I said, the searchlight style. And specifically for each searchlight, I wanted to be able to do all three colors, red, yellow, and green. Uh, to do that with the LEDs I chose, you have a couple options. Uh, you need a tricolor LED, first of all, to do it. And there's a couple different types you can do. You know, there's your you know, four-pin tricolor LEDs, where basically you've got a red, a green, and a yellow dye inside there with a common, either common anode or cathode. I can't remember which one specifically this was. But the downside of these, this is a 5mm version. You get them in 3mm, too. The downside of this is that you've got a lot of wires you need to run off of here. You know, even if you combine all the grounds on all the lights here, which you can do, you still have three wires coming off every signal, you know, on the entire bridge. It adds up really quick. So I wanted to just do a simple two-pin LED. This is a bicolor, red and green. The nice thing about it, though, is if you feed it AC at the right duty cycle, you get a nice yellow out of it. And that's what I'm doing on this bridge. So for all the signals I put in here, I've got two-pin LEDs on each one. Um, still ends up being a lot of wires, you know, so I've got eight on here, 16 wires coming off. Um, but still much more manageable than having, you know, additional wire for every signal basically coming off this bridge. So on the bottom, you know, the actual signal mounts themselves, I, I just get bashed. I used some small styrene tube, um, drilled the holes, tried to hide the wires as much as possible in there, which turned out pretty well. I added a walkway across the top, little uh, access walkways here um, to the actual lights. I need to add more handrails and get some ladders and stuff in there. There's more to do, but this is just where I'm at right now. Overall, I turned out pretty well. I routed all the wires to the bottom, so it's barely visible when you're looking at the signal from a normal angle, which is kind of nice. In the back, you can see them a little bit, and then it runs down the side, but it's the best I can do. It still needs to be painted, you know, further detail, stuff like that, but I'm happy with the way it turned out right now, um, and it will be functional, which is, which is nice. So for the driving electronics, I looked at commercially available stuff out there right now. There's a bunch. I won't get into them all. They're pretty feature-rich. As far as I can tell, I think most of them would work fine, but they're expensive. Uh, especially if you're running a bridge like this, you need a lot of signals to do all the possible aspects. Do I need all the aspects? No. Yeah, I probably only, I mean, even in real life, I've only seen a couple of these ever. You know, you never see the crazy ones, especially the flashing ones and stuff like that, at least in my area. But if I'm doing the bridge, I figured, well, let's just make it fully functional electronics so I can do every possible aspect on there. And for now, the way I'm designing this is just going to be manually controlled. I'm just going to have some push buttons on the front of my layout that I can do, and I can manually set the signals how I wish. But with my design, the way I'm doing this is I'm going to have it also, you know, full TTL compatible in terms of logic, so I can drive it with basically anything. You know, if I wanted to interface it to, you know, whatever system out there I wanted to, um, I would be able to do so. And that was what, one of the kind of the uh, design considerations that I have for this, you know, is in terms of doing it. So my initial design for the electronics is here. 
uh, on this breadboard. It's just this strip of circuitry right here that's driving it. And you can see with my little mock-up LED that I have there, I can basically set it to red or green. Now I can also set it to yellow. So I'm doing just, basically it's just a simple state machine that I'm using to set those states with a couple flip-flops. And then I've got a 555 driving the whole circuit along with some other glue logic in there to make everything work. The, the logic I have right now, the schematic anyway, looks like this. So I've got the two flip-flops. I'm just using 7474 D-type flip-flops on here, but I'm not even using the data feature of them. I'm just using basically the set reset feature along with the single you know, Q output. I'm not worried about the inverted state on the outputs. With that, I've got three inputs for my three lights, simple truth table there. So uh, in these combinations, I get green, red, yellow, and then also there's an off state, which is important if I wanted to implement the flashing or just leave the actual light off as well. To drive the light, I'm doing it with a 555. So the AC signal I'm doing is, is generated from that 555. It's just a simple oscillator, but the important part about it is I can adjust the duty cycle of it pretty much from all the way to like plus 90 to minus 90. I guess that doesn't make sense. 90% towards green or 90% towards red, and then anywhere in between to get the yellow. The reason for that is is because with these LEDs, a perfect 50% duty cycle doesn't necessarily get you a nice yellow color. A lot of times that will be kind of either pushed red or green depending on the LED. So with this, I can tweak it and get an exact nice uh, yellow color on there. And the way that works, the signal comes in and basically I'm inverting one side of it driving the LED and typically both of these sides will go to ground. So by switching one of these to ground or the other, switching one to high, one high, one ground, one ground, one high, I can force this to either be red or I can force it to be green. Or if both are basically to ground, then they both conduct and they get the nice yellow out of there. And that's what's being controlled by these two flip-flops here. I have some state logic here to basically allow me to reset it from yellow back to red or green. Um, and then, like I said, I've got push buttons. I control each state there. And then the input I can drive externally from another one of these modules for the signal. And then I have an output as well that I can feed off to feed you know, down to another block or something like that. And that's how I control cascading signals you know, down the line. Now, the problem with this design is that if I want that blinking state, it gets a little bit more complex. So I've already got one, two, three four ICs just to drive this whole circuit right here. I can, you know, I can share some components um, on this for multiple signals. Because again, this is just for one searchlight signal. So for a three light, you know, if the aspect's on there to do it, I need this circuit times three times. Now you're looking at the bridge. I've got eight signals on there, so this circuit would have to be repeated almost eight times. So that's already a lot of integrated circuits to do that. The problem with that is, is that when you start wanting to add the blinking feature on there to make the light flash, any aspect flash. Because looking at the aspect charts, many combinations of these, almost every any light can flash. You know, bottom, middle, top. So you need all three to be able to flash. So I need another state in there, which means another flip-flop. And then additional control logic, and there's different ways I can implement it based on that. The point of it is, it just starts getting really complex to implement this way. I chose to do it this way because it would be really cheap to do. I've got boxes of TTL logic. I can just throw these together, get a board made, throw it on there. It wouldn't have really cost me anything other than the board. But now, based on the size of everything I need to build here, the boards are getting really big, which starts making things more expensive. So I'm leaning towards microcontroller instead, which is what I really didn't want to do. I mean, it's obviously the right solution here, but it's not ideal. I mean, truly the right solution is to go to like an FPGA to do this because I mean, everything here in terms of what this, what the schematic is just screams FPGA. And I could use, you know, FPGAs or CPLDs on there. I mean, this thing could drive with the number of inputs and outputs on here and to implement these state machines and everything, this could drive pretty much every signal in my layout. The problem is, is I have these chips. I've got, you know, boxes of them. And so it's free to me, but if I do release this code and the hardware and, you know, just out to the public for other people to use if they wish to do it, you know, nobody's going to want to spend the money for FBGAs or CPLDs. It gets really cost prohibitive at that point. So the alternative is just to use a microcontroller, which is probably what I'm going to do. Um, I've always used PIC microcontrollers. They're reliable. They're really cheap. They're easy to program. The PIC 18F series I like because you can actually program that with NC. I use the C18 compiler the microchip provides. So I can implement all of the signal for all the different aspects, um, at least for one, one row probably. I haven't thought it all complete yet. But one of these on a single chip, and these are really inexpensive. They're like three bucks. And they need basically no external circuitry to use. You can use the internal clock oscillator to drive this. You can, um, all the I.O. on there is 5-volt TTL compatible to drive everything. So other than a couple resistors externally to, to make this work, that's all they would really need. So again, it becomes really inexpensive to drive this entire signal bridge, you know, for including making the boards, probably 20 bucks for everything here, uh, which is nice. 
And then again, it's my design, so I can control it however I want in terms of the interfacing. Um, I can add the automation in there too, so that after a certain amount of time, the lights automatically change colors. You can do block detection. You can do all sorts of stuff with it, which will be really nice. But that's kind of where I'm at right now, at least with the design of it. I've still got a little bit more work to do, but I was just really happy with how the bridge turned out. I think the bridge turned out pretty cool looking, except I just already broke my hand real on there, but uh, not a big deal. I'll glue that back down. The, the bridge is really strong too. I mean, this it, it glued together really nice. It's really tough. I'm not worried about actually breaking the signals or anything there, which is good. And there's a couple little mistakes I made um, doing this together, but once I have it painted, I think it'll look really good. I'm still to try and decide if I want to paint it black, like you see in a lot of these older bridges. You know, have like weathered because it's such an old bridge or to paint the whole thing silver with some light weathering like you see in more of the modern bridges out there so i don't know i'm undecided on that i still got to think about it but anyway this has just been a fun project just wanted to give an update um this is where i'm at with it right now still got a little bit more design work to do for the actual logic of it but yeah just wanted to share this update so hopefully everyone found that interesting and uh thanks for watching